Woody Allen once pondered who was right. Rousseau, who thought man was a noble creature, capable of poetry and altruism, or Hobbes, who thought that life was nasty, brutal and short. After much thought, Woody Allen concluded that during the week, Hobbes was right, and in the weekend, Rousseau was right. <laughs> right now, the smart money is on Hobbes. The world seems very brutal. But I believe that ultimately, logic and truth will prevail over ignorance and hate. I drew this cartoon here in the wake of the killing of 11 writers and cartoonists working in the Paris offices of Charlie Hebdo, a small circulation publication that routinely mocked all faiths with more vigour than finesse. In the wake of multiple threats, lawsuits and a firebombing, the editor vowed, we have to carry on until Islam has been rendered as banal as Catholicism. No such luck. He was gunned down at his desk by French brothers with links to Al-Qaeda. Within hours in another part of Paris, Islamist gunmen shot dead a Jewish man in a kosher supermarket. Three weeks later in Copenhagen, at a public meeting called in support of free expression and support also for a Swedish artist who once depicted the Prophet Muhammad as a dog, very pathetic drawings by the way, and has lived with death threats ever since, during the meeting, a filmmaker stepped outside, possibly for a cigarette or to get some fresh air, and he was shot dead by another Islamist gunman trying to get in and spread mayhem. Security guards returned fire. The gunman escaped, went to a synagogue, and shot dead a Jewish man. One of the organizers, the Danish writer Hel Brisk, commented angrily, first you go after the cartoonists, then you go after the Jews. This was pretty much the order that Adolf Hitler did it in. People don't realize this, but all during the 1920s and 1930s in Germany, the editors and writers and cartoonists of the Munich Post reminded Bavaria and Germany and the world, none of whom were particularly interested, all about Hitler's squalid behavior, his criminality, and his evil intents. Hitler hated them and tried to get them closed down. When he eventually came to power, within a few hours, their offices were destroyed, copies of the newspapers were burnt in the streets, and the staff were hauled off to concentration camps. Thanks to Nazi Germany, in a way, I grew up in New Zealand. My Irish father was stationed in Munich after the war as part of the army of occupation. He was in a bar in Munich one night, my father told me this, a Maori soldier was called a monkey by one of the locals. My father said the Maori didn't want to make a fuss about this insult, but his Pākehā mates took exception and absolutely tore the place apart, absolutely ripped it to shreds. British military policemen came running, blowing their whistles and waving long truncheons and threatening arrest, and my father said to me, you know what, the Kiwis kicked the snot out of them as well. <laughs> he said it was magnificent, and watching the New Zealanders beat the crap out of British military policemen was all the proof my father needed. He decided to immigrate to New Zealand. He arrived in New Zealand and he never, <laughs> ever wanted to go back. Yeah, I asked my father once, what did you do during the war, Dad? I was a fucking hero. <laughs> when Churchill called for volunteers to assassinate Hitler, I put my hand up and I flew to Berlin under cover of darkness. I parachuted down, went round to the chancellery, knocked on the door, who should answer but hear Hitler himself? So I grabbed the little fucker and I strangled him with my bare hands. And I got back to Britain, they wanted to give me a swag of medals, and I said, no, no medals for me. It's just anything any extraordinarily brave man would have done in my place. <laughs> he also left Ireland and Great Britain to get away from religious intolerance. My mother was Catholic. My father was Protestant. Neither of them could abide the retaliatory violence between the IRA and the Ulster Defence League. This cartoon, which I've just seen, was about the troubles in Northern Ireland. Someone once said, anyone who understands the troubles in Northern Ireland isn't fully informed. I don't agree with that. I think the killing of innocents, no matter how noble the cause, is always wrong. I grew up in the Manawatu. 
I, I loved my rugby, I still do, and it angered me when I was growing up that Maori players were banned from going to South Africa on all-black tours. After public debate and some disquiet, they were eventually allowed to go with the All Blacks as honorary whites. They had to enter South Africa as honorary whites. Just despicable. The euphemism back then for white South Africa's legally sanctioned slavery was separate development. The South Africans said, oh, we've got separate development. I did this cartoon as a satire on separate development. When apartheid eventually collapsed of its own accord, I did this cartoon here. And... Um, that's basically what happened when apartheid crumbled. Both sides were, in theory, equal at last. In the town in Cayenne in France, which was demolished in two world wars, they have a peace museum with a permanent collection of cartoons dedicated to peace. And much to my delight and surprise, they've actually picked that cartoon out and are now part of the permanent collection in Cayenne. Apartheid is just one of Africa's many plagues. In the bygone age, it was malaria. 20 years ago, it was AIDS. Then swine fever, which is what this cartoon is about. We were all panic-stricken about swine fever, and I did this cartoon as a response to that. Now it's Ebola. Things are changing, though, in Africa. Somewhere on this vast continent, this vast continent, waking from a deep slumber, the next Shanghai was already being born. The first overseas country I visited was former Yugoslavia on a Qantas press junket. The upstairs bubble, this was so long ago, the upstairs, I still had hair for a start, and the upstairs bubble in our 747 was a bar. The entire bubble upstairs was a bar, and the Aussie journalists had knocked off all the beer before he left Australian airspace. <laughs> Yugoslavia was a devastatingly beautiful country before it was devastated. It was the most beautiful country I've ever seen. It's obviously, it's my first one. It still remains high on my list. George Bernard Shaw said of Dubrovnik, if there was a heaven on earth, it is Dubrovnik. During the war, the Serbs shelled it. This cartoon is my response to Europe descending into darkness for the second time in less than 40 years. To that list, I would now have to add Libya, Syria, Iraq, Nigeria, Somalia, Pakistan, and people who watch YouTube and Twitter. <laughs> the internet, which promised to confirm our common humanity and global interconnectedness, also allows psychopaths to reach out to each other, exchange conspiracy theories and recipes for roadside bombs. My heroes in cartooning are the New Zealander David Lowe and an American called Pat Oliphant. David Lowe, in the 1930s, saw Hitler with much the same piercing clarity as the cartoonist in the Munich Post. And Ronald, Pat Oliphant saw the lights going out in Ronald Reagan's eyes while the rest of America was still basking in their president's purred assurances that it was still morning again in America. David Lowe was never afraid to pass judgment on events, never afraid to challenge conventional wisdom or to offend the, the establishment. His views ran counter to the owners of his newspapers but such was his authority and self-evident truth of his work, they had to let it stand. In every cartoonist, there was a little bit of an Old Testament prophet, a whiskey priest, a strutting martinet, a class clown, and a scolding teacher. We have to think, when we sit down at our drawing board, we have to think that we know best and that we're terribly amusing, or why bother picking up your pen? My friend, the cartoonist Murray Ball, said the mark of a good teacher, and cartoonists regard themselves as teachers, the mark of a good teacher was that when they knew nothing about a specialist subject, they were never afraid to invite in a guest listener. <laughs> you, you have to think carefully about that. <laughs> That's what cartoonists do. Every day, I invite in guest listeners to hear what profound thoughts have passed through my skull. In 2008, I was fortunate enough to share a public lecture in Wellington with the celebrated French cartoonist Jean Plantu when he visited New Zealand. He was very complimentary about my work and he invited me to an international conference on cartooning for peace held by the United Nations in Rome. I showed this one here about the, Israel's overreaction to aid being sent. And 
I did this to a hall much like this, full of university students, and I shocked a very sweet, decent cartoonist from Israel. He was very upset at my work, and he got all the other cartoonists together and said, should Tom's work be allowed to be shown? And I went, though while he didn't like it, the cartoonists from Nigeria, Algeria, Iran, Egypt, Japan, the United States, England, and Palestine, as well as the audience, seemed to enjoy my work. The Palestinian and his wife, and the Palestinian needed Israel's permission to get, even leave the West Bank. All his travel documents had to be stamped by the State of Israel. This tiny wee guy, petite little man and his shy wife, they sidled up to me one morning at breakfast in our hotel, and he said to me in a very low whisper, looking around cautiously, he said, how come, how come you are so brave? I said, oh, I live in Wellington, New Zealand. <laughs> That's true. All I live with, really, is the daily fear of paper cuts but it's not the same thing. <laughs> I drew this cartoon for the Don Post in the wake of Israel's invasion of southern Lebanon. There was a cover of Time magazine and also a cover of Newsweek showed similar photographs of streets in southern Lebanon absolutely destroyed by Israeli shelling. And alongside the drawing of destroyed buildings, I did the Torah being ripped apart. This cartoon offended almost everyone in Wellington's small Jewish community, a delegation of Jewish elders led by a rabbi sought a meeting with me and my editor in the office. We had the meeting, and it was very civil, and very polite, and they accepted my right of freedom of expression. Then some of them with tears in their eyes said, the Torah was so sacred to them, seeing it rent apart, even in a drawing, was very, very hurtful. They said that cartoon hurt our feelings, it really did hurt our feelings. I had no idea, of course, yeah, that this would happen. And I said I would look in the future, if I ever need ever rose, I would use a different metaphor than a torn Torah. And it was quite a civilized conversation, but that's not really the point. The point is they did not burst into the Dominion Post newsroom and spray the place with bullets. We had a civilized discussion about it. The sacred role of the political cartoonist is to find holes in the veneer through which fun can be poked. The mighty need to be mocked, and they are not always grateful. Court jesters in medieval England found it a real bugger getting life insurance. There are limited prospects for career advancement as a court jester. The Taliban, these are frightful, ghastly, vile, medieval, primitive men brutally treating their women, and ISIS are just as bad, and Al-Qaeda are just as bad. That branch of Islam needs to develop a sense of humour. but. Christianity has nothing to be smug about. Shakespeare's family had to hide their Catholic Bibles in the attic when Protestant political correction squads roamed the English landscape. And this cartoon is to show the fact in two world wars, German belt buckles bore the inscription, Gott mit uns, which means God is with them, God is with us. German soldiers, God is with us. Even as SS troopers herded naked women and children into gas chambers, if they felt even a smidgen of disquiet, they only needed to glance down to the abdomen and to know that everything was as it should be. Gott mit uns. This cartoon is about the real issue facing the earth, global warming and climate change. I like this drawing. I was quite pleased with it. Sometimes you do a drawing and you're pleased with it. So all the sectarian squabbles and ethnic battles and debates and arguments over X-factor judging and Bruce Jenner's gender realignment, everything, everything right now will shrink into insignificance when global warming and climate change kick in. As, crop, as crops fail and oceans rise, the wave of North Africans now risking their lives crossing the Mediterranean to Europe, will be but the first droplet of rain hitting the window before the deluge. It's going to be shocking, and that is what we're facing if we don't change our behavior. At the risk of sounding like Paul McCartney, I do believe that people are the same wherever you go, and Ebony and Ivory do live side by side on his piano keyboard, oh Lord. We are an intelligent, decent, creative, innovative species. 
at least 95% of us are. 5% of nutters and shitheads can ruin it for everybody, but... Yeah. You people are on the right side, obviously. And when those psychopaths get in charge, then it's chaos. We are decent and optimistic people. If we don't address the problem of climate change very soon, we are going to have a god-awful mess. And I was thinking, when I walked through the British Museum and saw those big dinosaur skeletons, I thought, what if mankind doesn't listen to the whoop, 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 pull-up signal coming from the dashboard? I thought, well, maybe this is what will happen. Maybe a thousand years from now, rats will go on school trips to museums, and that is what they will see. I sincerely hope not. Thank you very much.